Among the landmarks of Louisiana, there are many faded reminders of what we've lost or even forgotten. Commonplaces that seem familiar, but distant and even blurred. The old stores and signs and town squares can still be found along the smaller roads, but in just a few more years they will all be gone. It's too late to save many of the things our grandparents thought would last forever. Maybe the best we can do is enjoy them while we can. In the town of Mangum, the past shines most brilliantly in an afternoon sun. The long, warm rays washing over this store, maybe for the last time, and maybe breathing life into the old bricks once again. It's terribly romantic, of course, this longing we feel for a grand old husk of a landmark. But there also isn't a soul among us so cold as to pass by this old store without at least once wishing it could betray its secrets. In Mangum, the story would contain two floods, a fire, and a tornado. We have a few examples, a few for instances, of places we are saving places that are dying, and places we should all miss dearly. People and places in this program and stories of lost Louisiana. We miss the familiar places like the abandoned stores you'll find in almost every town. Rain had an old store, really an old friend of a hundred years. It closed in 1990. A department, big department store with everything in it, so it makes it kind of bad. President Mervyn Jankauer. We're going out very quietly, and you would be amazed at the way we have been received by the public since we announced that we're going out. In 1884, Mervyn Kahn was a young businessman traveling to Texas by train. He happened to stop here, liked it, and founded a trading post at the station's door. The family business grew and in its heyday covered a downtown block. Like many merchants of the last century, Khan, his wife and six children lived above the store. All the families of Rain grew with Mervines until it became the Sears and Roebucks of central Louisiana. Longtime manager, Barney Foreman. We sold horse-drawn equipment, uh, plows, Georgia stock, wagons, hardware and appliances, giftware, Red ladies ready to wear, men's clothing, shoes, uh, just about anything that a family could use. And I really enjoyed it, and uh, we're like a, a family over here. People of the area got to know this store as their store. You would always hear them say, I'm going to my store, Mervine's. Okay. And uh, over the years, I've no matter who I talk to, they say, where do you, where do you work? And I said, Marvin Conway, oh yes, I used to shop there. My family shopped there, my grandparents shopped there. But sometime in the 80s, people stopped shopping at their store. They could find what they needed at a chain store or the mall in Lafayette. The final straw was broken when Mervine's New York buyer went under after 77 years. Mervine's was the firm's first customer. The goods were trimmed down to what could fit in the original 1884 sales floor. But in its time, what a marvel to behold the pneumatic tube accounting system of genius simplicity. This is the Lampson tube system, which as far as we can tell was installed in Mervyn Kahn Company in 1925. What happens here is when a sale is made, the, the, the slip and all the money go into this little tube. It's closed up, it's, this lid is open and it goes up into a central cashier's desk. It saves you the expense. It saves you the, all the problems that you get with a uh, individual cash register. Everything goes to one central point and it's very, very quick. Here, here it comes back down. The store, like so many landmarks, quietly faded. Like so many landmarks, it will someday be forgotten. When the shops go, so do the people. Or is that the other way around? Whichever, in the end, it's more than the places. The community is gone, too. There's not a more tragic or sudden example than a storm, a hurricane, for instance. The place, a little island on the coast.
charmant petit village, quatre mille de long, église, école, belle plage. Dès qu'ils font du sel, quand ils font des comme dans un charming little village. Four miles long, church, school, beautiful beach. They that furnished a quantity of fish. Farming came easily, the soil was good. Everyone earned his living, one can say amply, for in fact everybody more or less had money. Brave people, fishermen, a perfect understanding. Worked hard during the week, but on Sunday it was a feast. Hubert Terrio is a descendant of the people of the Chenier. The ragged paper he carefully unfolds is a poem written in 1893. The pages are 100 years old now, and the words, in French, describe one day in the Chenier. They also detail the catastrophe that forever changed a unique way of life. The wind blows always, increases in velocity. Then at 8 o'clock at night, sadness is everywhere. 80 miles an hour, what speed blows this wind? Houses shatter, water everywhere, this is the storm. It was a busy and prosperous weekend 100 years ago. Steamboats took off with seafood. A trolley line ran the length of Grand Isle and late season tourists still swam in the clear water or posed on this southern Louisiana beach. The families of the Chenier thought the drizzling rain that day would pass as it usually did. There was Sunday mass at the church, later in the day a wedding. This being the Sabbath, most people were at home. According to the poem, the fishermen enjoyed their day off, and besides, the weather was getting too rough to fish. The wind had picked up to a full gale by that Sunday night. Families hurried inside. Among them, Dave Jeremy. Five years old at the time, his eyewitness account is the last you'll ever hear. Before he died a few years ago, he recalled once more in this rare video the horror of that night and the terror that he survived. J'avais cinq ans dans ce temps-là. Je me rappelle de ça, la compagnie de chasse hier. Il y a un calme, calme. Pas de monde du tout. Je t'attendais pas personne. Personne qui parlait, personne du tout. Et là, à ma première nuit, t'attendais ça à venir là, comme si c'était... Enfin, ça faisait assez de train, ça pouvait faire peur. Et quand ça, c'est ça qui qu nous a baillé. On attendait le monde qui passait sur les radeaux et qui s'en allait. Là. Là, le lendemain matin, quand on s'enlevait, le eh ben, les noyés n'étaient pas à 10 pieds de distance que tu voyais sur la terre. Dans ce sac qu'ils ont fait, tous ceux qui avaient des parents, ils s'avaient sauvés avec nous autres et qui avaient des parents qui étaient noyés. Là. water. Lovella Due remembers. It was finished in May of 1893. The family moved in and uh, lived there for about four months until the hurricane 
came in uh, October 1st. Uh, it was built by my grandfather, Nicholas Curol, and he and his wife and his two and a half year old daughter were in the house with several other people. I'm not sure exactly how many other people were in there at the time of the, the hurricane. And uh, well, during the hurricane, uh, it was knocked off its blocks, but it survived the storm. And uh, the next morning when uh, everything was over, my grandfather had to walk through waters, he said, up to his chest uh, to get to his boat. This house was built on the Bayou Thunder side, so it was away from the bay. So I guess that's what, probably why it survived and some of the others closer to the bay did not. My father lived in, uh, in Chenier with his family of nine, eight, and, and all. Schaefer and, Nicole uh, lives in Golden Meadow. His, his ancestors his survived the hurricane to tell a story that's become well known around town. He drifted, caught himself on logs, didn't know how to swim. His family didn't know how to, knew how to swim, but they all drowned. He saw a light in the attic. No, okay. Now he, he was, was at the mulberry tree. Okay. He, he dropped his driftwood that he was hanging on and he grabbed the top part of the mulberry tree. That's why he always did have mulberry tree home, always. Anyhow, and he hollered. He saw a light in the attic and he hollered. So they opened the door and they pulled him in. That's how he got saved. Do people around here still talk about it to a degree? I mean, maybe the older people do, but I'm, the younger people might not. But do you try to keep that story alive, stories like this? Well. He wasn't too much to talk about it. Don't hear too much about it. Every once in a while, you hear somebody pop up, you know, with some... Nelson Sheremy runs a seafood packing house on Grand Isle, much as his Chenier ancestors did. My grandmother, between my grandmother and grandfather, lost 13 of them, brothers and sisters, between the both of them. 13 all in one family? Well, like two families. I mean, two families? Yeah. And uh, the only one that survived was uh, my grandmother and the brother and my grandfather and his sister. The only one that survived out of the whole family. Uh, same team. And uh, and uh, like I said, they were there with She moved. never talked about how she took it hard or? Oh yeah, I mean, she, like she went, they moved to that, that place, a little settlement, Periyak, and uh, they live in a little, a little shack made with palmetto and no floor. And uh, she had four children. The stories survive with the older people, but Jeremy says even his generation is starting to forget. A lot of my family went through a lot of trouble, but uh, we got out of it. And uh, but some people are still uh, uh, try to work it up, but they can bring it to. some people with enough years behind them to realize history is important. I'm trying to build leave it like it was from 1893 to 1914. Take for example John Boudreau. He runs the hotel at Leeville, just up Highway 1 from the Chenier. What he's building is a replica of his town as he remembers it. People, this uh, building that was Mr. Martin, Mr. Uh, Lafar store, house and saloon. And the reason why they got three buildings like that in those days, they didn't, uh, they, they didn't have right to uh, 
It was against the law to have liquor in the store, so they had to build a little saloon on the side. That's why that's why you see that. Right. Yeah. And this building here <clears throat> was uh, the Woodman of the World. The Woodman of the World. The Wood Woodman of the World. IWW. Yes, sir. That's what it was. Now these are the buildings that uh, that was there those days that people were living in. Just set them up. That's good like they are? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you do this because if you didn't, there'd be nobody else to tell the story of Leeville? It It'd be forgotten. Like, it sounds like It'd nothing. be forgotten. I'm, I'm bringing it It'd back to life. I'm bringing it, I'm trying to bring it back to life. I'm trying to make the people not to forget Leeville, how it was and how we live and everything else. You understand? I'm trying, trying to show that to the people who have got a little bit of experience of that. Try to, try to make them remember their past. Come on down and see it, Boudreaux says. It's important that we all remember. Hubert Terrio says when he was younger, he didn't oh, care much for the old stories. But now, he collects all he can about the hurricane. I don't think any of them had, had ever been through a hurricane before. They'd been through little storms. And they all thought it was just a small storm. But there are some people that, that said before the storm that there was going to be a lot of people that would die. They like uh, an avertissement, you know, something as if they, they knew. Like, uh, as one man, he said he was going to die that night, within the hour. And his wife started to cry, thinking that he was going to commit suicide. But it wasn't. It wasn't that. She asked people to, to please try to turn him from committing suicide. And he said he wasn't committing suicide, but he was going to drown. And he did. Do you think that a lot of people know about this, or do you think that you need to keep the story alive because there are a lot of people? I think know. it would be good to keep the story alive if the kids would be interested. But uh, there's a lot of kids, I think, they don't, they're not interested in that. Actually, when my mother would talk about it, when we were young, we weren't interested. And I guess the kids say, oh, it's just the same. When they'll get old yeah. and they'll, they'll hear about it, then they'll be interested that it may be too late. There won't be anybody around to tell them what happened. These are the people who refuse to let the stories die. They say the tragedy of the hurricane is one example of a community surviving. In recalling their stories of surviving together, the modern residents of the Chenier area may find the strength to stay together just a little longer. Lost Louisiana will continue. Churches and temples are built to stand long after the worldly has crumbled. But every now and then a church building is abandoned. It's a good thing there is often good conscience among its parishioners. In New Orleans, taking back a church has reawakened the descendants of Irish immigrants, repairing broken memories of a sad story and a rich culture. The lights are coming on again at St. Alphonsus. For nearly 20 years, this church has been closed. It had been gradually abandoned by its parishioners. They simply moved out of this old neighborhood. Somewhere in time, the gold leaf was painted over with dull beige. Before we took over the church, we had derelicts living in it for about eight to 10 years. They had uh, come in through the crawl spaces beneath the church, and this was a, a home for them. They used to start little fires in, in trash cans on the high altar here to keep warm in the winter. From the first mass celebrated here in 1857, it was an immigrant's church. That makes it all the more surprising how ornate and costly its decorations were. The money that poor Irish laborers paid to furnish their church is a testament to their pride in the community they had built here. That pride is still evident 136 years later in Bill Murphy, who is part caretaker, part historian for this beautiful Catholic church. The money, that they put, the money that they put into it, they could bring their, their family here and say, I built this with my hands. 
because mm -hmm. a lot of the people who contributed to b the, the money to build the church actually physically helped erect it. Uh, and this, this was their artifact. This was an artifact of their culture. Murphy knows firsthand why the descendants of the Irish immigrants yeah. who built St. Um, Alphonsus left really the old neighborhood. Coming from. The great American dream was to, to in here in, in this Irish section of the city, was to make enough money to move to the suburbs. Kids move away and folks want to get jobs in other parts of, of the city and things like that. Does it just naturally happen? When I was in grammar school here during the 40s, my friends would talk about, gee, my mom and dad are going to going to make enough money and buy a house in Gentilly, a, a move to Metairie. Now I run into them in the neighborhood. They come back to the church and I say, how? How you doing? How, how are things going? But we wouldn't. just moved back. Oh, I bought my dad's that? old house. Really? <laughs> and they're moving back in the area. Wow. So they're coming back. They're, they're even looking for their roots in this particular part of the city. Something is igniting a new search for roots among Irish descendants in Louisiana. Perhaps it's that they see other ethnic groups interested in their cultural ties. At a pub on Toulouse Street, they're dancing the jigs and reels again. Irish Americans like Sister Bernadette McNamara say her people are getting together more than ever. Irish musical groups are touring and that's meant new interest in the traditional songs, dances, and customs. Every Saturday night she has students who dance here and then she, we're all involved in the dancing. That's why I come here Saturday night, mm. for Irish dancing. You enjoy that? Oh, I do. <laughs> Is it authentic? Very much so. Barkeep Terry Folan has also seen the change in his customers' conversations. People would show up with St. Patrick's Day for the, the idea of green beer or shamrock or leprechauns and that sort of thing. That, has, I suppose, much to do with Irish Americana and very little to do with Ireland. And when you have a authentic pint of Guinness and a authentic bar, people have a tendency, I think, to uh, start, you know, the conversations change, too. And when you have Irish sit, an Irishman sitting next to you, you're more likely to, uh, for Americans, to be more likely to be interested in what, what their roots mean rather than what they think they've been told they mean. Yes, I know it's a cliche talking about Irish history in an Irish pub, but this happens to be, in modern Louisiana, the only place that Irish Americans can come to experience some of the original culture. At the turn of the 18th century, back when New Orleans was the second largest city in America, tens of thousands of Irish families found homes in this Catholic, and it's worth mentioning, anti-British city, pub owner and Irishman Danny O'Flaherty. The chieftains of Ireland left Ireland, went to Spain and France, and the Cartys were, were part of the, the big chieftains who left Ireland, and <laughs> their grandson ended up in in Louisiana, and uh, next thing, there was the, the battle of New, the famous battle of New Orleans was fought in his backyard. Mm -hmm. And he, as a, I think the famous, I don't know if I can quote what he said, but there was something in in reference of my grandfather left Ireland because of them, and here they are again out in front of my front yard. <laughs> the red coats. The red coats. <laughs> there was nothing for him at It's the classic story of American immigrants with a cruel twist. The passage aboard English sailing ships was so miserable and filthy, many died en route. When they got here, they died by the thousands of yellow fever and cholera, and tens of thousands more fell while digging the new basin canal through the densest Louisiana swamps. Six miles long, 60 feet wide, and six feet deep from the heart of the city north to Lake Pontchartrain. A walk through Canal Street graveyards will reveal just a few of the family names. Most poor laborers were buried in unmarked pauper's fields. They unwittingly traded economic oppression in Ireland for just a chance here. 
yet for the betterment of water commerce, many lost their lives. Coming from the climate of Ireland into this climate was like a night and day difference. And this was a swamp then, yellow fever. Uh, and if you're working out in the swamp digging a canal, thousands and thousands oh, died. Oh, they don't even know. They, they estimate from 15,000 to, to 30,000 died. And, but not just from yellow fever that was transmitted by, by mosquitoes. They didn't know that at the time. They call it the stranger's disease. It was also, um, there was alligators out there. <laughs> My God, and, 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 and you know, they're, 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 they're working the tools of the day were wheelbarrow, pick, pick and, and shovel. They didn't have the equipment they had in the Panama Canal. So I think their feet was more than the Panama Canal, which the French started and Americans finished. Irish immigrants soon rose above the caste of laborer to become boarding house operators, restaurateurs, and merchants. They especially gravitated to civic jobs as fire and policemen. Gradually, as they wove themselves into the tapestry of the, the existing city, the, the, uh, the French, the Creole, the German, the uh, Spanish that was here, lots of them became respected people. They made it. But somewhere along the way, like other groups with a strong cultural identity, blending in meant losing their traditions. A point of pride and remembrance is the restoration of St. Alphonsus. All of it is very detailed, hand-wrought hand work. Even this altar of St. Joseph is, is interesting. This was called the, the altar of a happy marriage. And you're finally able to restore it? Yes. Or starting to? We're beginning. Just we're, beginning. We're just beginning. We, we probably are I'm looking saying. at 10 to 20 years. Retying some of the down. threads of our It'll rich Louisiana culture. For a very long time. And it will be worth it. I think so. Old theaters have always had a certain romantic pull on people, it seems. The Strand, the Liberty in Eunice, there used to be the Paramount in Baton Rouge. And if you hang around stage doors long enough, you're bound to meet some interesting people. That's a big trunk. Well, they don't make them this big anymore, but my bass fiddle fits in here, Jeff, and that's the reason I like to have it where my bass fiddle slide inside. And uh, it don't have the computers in it, and, but it fits in perfect. Put the guitar in the trunk and have my bass. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. And then I, I Tillman the Franks band. knows country music. In fact, he's known some of the biggest names in country music personally. This is like a country music shrine here. Really? Every time I come to this old auditorium, it brings back so many dear memories to me. A lot of interesting folks have come through here. Elvis and Hank and Johnny Cash and Johnny Horton and uh, Jim Rees and just name them on and on. Webb Pierce, Farron Young, Didn't you wreck that car? Tillman played with the greatest stars of country music. That's him with Johnny Horton and just behind the young king of rock and roll. And by the way, Hank's wearing Tillman's suit. Tonight he'll play the hayride again with the same enthusiasm he did more than 30 years ago. It's gonna really be a, a good show and we're gonna have lots of fun here tonight. I'm gonna slap that old bass fiddle out there on the stage tonight. It's really gonna be fun, Jeff. Pure country. Pure country, boy, like we used to. Uh -huh. It's fun, gonna be fun. I'm looking forward to it. This building knows country music. It sheltered some of the biggest names of all. Yet most of the time it stands empty. And the tears that I cried for that woman are gonna flood you, big river. And I'm gonna sit right here until I die. Johnny Cash, Johnny Horton, Slim Whitman, Webb Pierce, Lefty Frizzell, George Jones, Floyd Kramer, Tex Ritter. They've all been here. Tillman Franks remembers quite a few of them. And this is how Hank Williams Jr. tells the story of this cradle of the stars. Well, if the Opry was the promised land for country musicians on their way up, then the Louisiana Hayride was heaven's gate. They flocked to it, carrying guitars, fiddles, and songs, looking to make some money and a name for themselves, hoping for that one big hit that might mean a recording contract and the move to Nashville. The Hayride had a healthy respect for its older cousin, but the Louisiana show never advertised itself as a stepping stone to the Opry. 
It had its own reputation, and that was enough to keep its Saturday night roster filled. The hayride was a steady job, a rare piece of good fortune for anybody trying to make a living playing music. The hayride had it all, gospel, live bands, comedy, men singers, and girls. But it had something else that made it stand out, made it different from the other barn dance radio shows, a certain spirit that had a lot to do with its success. The show experimented with drums, singing styles, fancy guitar licks, and honky tonk. It was daring, and it got away with it. KWKH went on the air in 1925. Its signal reached most of East Texas, Southern Arkansas, and Northwest Louisiana. Station owner W.K. Henderson learned right off that folks in his rural neighborhood had at least one thing in common. They liked the music they understood. So he gave his listeners country, and his commercial sponsors loved him for it. How many biscuits did you eat this morning? Early morning country music shows got to be so popular on KWKH that the station added on a live Saturday night show. It wound up being a dress rehearsal for the hayride. It was plenty tough. It was practically, you, you almost starved. It was hard to make a living. It was, uh, it wasn't, that they looked down on music then. They called it hillbilly music. And uh, it wasn't recognized as really a, a the force it was, because they figured like there was really uh, real poor people and uh, sorry people. That, that that was the impression that they had. It was the, the type of people who were in it, and it was the, the image that we had to the public wasn't good back then. Hey, when Hank come in there and got such a tremendous impact, he began to get lots of the people that like other kinds of music. When he hit so big, like the people that was raised and would, would admit that they liked country music, you'd see them down at the right on Saturday night, but it, it was Hank Williams, and it, it really did. I, I would say that, that that was the impact that began to make it a national recognized show. If my daddy changed the show, well, the Hayride changed Hank Williams, too. Now the return of the Hayride may change Shreveport. The town is paying a new respect to the old music and slowly restoring the old municipal auditorium, where it all started. Elvis and Hank started here, and in a lot of American tourist minds, they left a mighty sweet sound. <laughs> That's enough of a tourist draw right there. If you That's could a, tell people Elvis Presley he, walked these very steps. He really did. This is it. This is where he first got national recognition. Yeah. When they first recognized that he could be a supercar, happened on this stage. Mm -hmm. Right out there in the center when he hit that guitar, That's All Right Mama, and the roof come in. That's when he broke. The floorboards of the hayride are ringing again. This time with the sound of the community cashing in. In Shreveport, they're trying to remember the roots of country music. In New Orleans, it's jazz. And bookmarks in the history of jazz music are disappearing fast. In this case, though, the National Park Service may be able to help. Mine was too bad. They got a whole lot of people to come here. They're musicians. A whole lot of them are musicians coming here. And they know what you're doing. And they know what it's worth. You know, I mean, right. the value of what they, right. you're doing. They enjoy it. Ah. They, come they come in here and they can't talk to you, but they they come maybe to Germany or Italy or some of them places, China, Japan, and they're, they're, they're musicians. In a cozy 200-year-old parlor, Percy and Willie Humphrey quietly prepare for another evening of jazz. This evening, it was Percy's birthday, his 89th birthday. This night, Willie was 93. The Humphrey brothers have headlined here at Percy Preservation Hall like for more than 30 years, and they were preparing to enter the recording studio to make yet another album. Some boys want to record my brother and I just a couple of days ago. What are you doing? Yeah, for money. The, the real kind of money. I don't mean no just... 
I don't mean for me, for peanuts. Late arriving jazz fans stumble through the dark room to find all the seats have been taken. Half of the Humphreys visitors tonight are from overseas, from France, where American jazz is sacred, from Germany, where authentic blues men play sold out soccer stadiums, and from Japan, where jazz musicians are as famous as rock stars. Those people buy records, always buy records, and they pay them to listen to them. And when they come to the States, that's what they want to hear. Some of them, like you take people who live in the States here, we hear the music, some songs we play, kind of, kind of ties them, they remember that. And they sing them, can sing them. We, we, some of the folks that does singing here, they get them to sing with them, you know, with the people, you know, they decide to enjoy themselves. The Crescent City Joymakers are one of a handful of old line jazz bands left in New Orleans who still play a regular gig in the French Quarter. Wednesdays and Saturdays, seven half hour sets a night. There's no bathroom and no bar. Just the music in a faded chamber revered as center stage for the soul of jazz. Of course, it's a bit morbid to mention, but practically you can't help wonder what will happen to the music when the musicians pass on. The history of jazz music is filled with artists who never committed their talent to vinyl. Maybe that's a small part of the fascination these visitors have with hearing hot jazz played in person before it's too late. For the first half of this century, every city was filled with bands of all types. Brass bands playing patriotic music in parades. Snazzy uniforms were the envy of every kid who wanted to be noticed. With some determination, you could make it into the groups who played for the benevolent societies. Black clubs and white clubs within earshot of each other. Before segregation and bigotry became really fashionable, New Orleans was a lot more ethnically mixed, and the musical styles and innovations got all jumbled up in what would later be called jazz bands. For the church social, you hired a band. Family reunions and political rallies hired the bands too. Remember, these were the days before television, before rock and roll. Even by the 1930s, a radio was the size of a refrigerator, the musicians made names for themselves. Georgia Tom Dorsey, Louis Dumaine, the Louisiana Shakers, the Mobile Strugglers, Jelly Roll Martin and Joe King Oliver. But only diehard jazz fans remember Kid Ory or the Superior Orchestra. Who but the serious collector has ever heard them play on a record? Hardly anyone. That saddens Don Marquis, a self-described jazz nut and curator of the State Museum's jazz exhibit. And this map sort of uh, illustrates that this is where we are now, the French Quarter, this is where the Mint is. Uh, back behind the quarter is the Treme area, that's where the Creoles lived. Uh, over in here was uh, Storyville, which was the red light district. Out here at the end of the streetcar line is uh, Carrollton. There's a lot of dairy farms out there. People would travel out in the streetcars and there were a number of parks and baseball parks politicians gave a speech, they had a band uh, lay a cornerstone, you have a band, it's it, it just part of the city. 
so there were a lot there were a lot more bands around and to, to hear each other and to be well the, it was all over town and every ethnic group prided themselves in having brass bands and people would uh, take the uh, Smoky Mary train which went out the Legion field this way and have picnics family gatherings on weekends that was a way to cool off and everybody had music if it was a little family group a guitar banjo player if it was a fraternal group or a club there would be a full band and everybody was in earshot of each other that's where a lot of the early music ideas got exchanged because everybody could hear what everybody else was doing all over town all types of music getting all mixed up then spit out of a horn as jazz in all those neighborhoods this is the treme and if any place is the cradle of modern jazz it's this corner of old new orleans now folks in chicago or even memphis may take issue with that but how about hearing it from some of the jazz men themselves those folks who carried that crazy hybrid music throughout the rest of the nation jazz men like sydney beche there was this club sydney says that we played at the 25 club that was about 1912 and all the time we played there people were talking about freddie kephart freddie had left new orleans with his band and was traveling all over the country playing towns on the orpheum circuit it seems like everyone along the circuit was coming up to Freddie to ask about this ragtime. Where did it come from? And back at the 25, friends of Freddie's kept coming around and showing the clippings, wanting to know what it was all about. It was a new thing back then. It left from here and went to Chicago. While many of the most talented musicians stayed home, in the Treme, this was the house of trombone great Jim Robinson. Guess what this work crew was installing next door the very day we came to see it? A nicely poured, brand new, concrete parking lot. Eunice, Louisiana. Here they have a National Park Service interpretive center. That means that besides saving old buildings, the Department of the Interior provides Cajun cooking demonstrations, whip-making shows, and Indian basket-weaving presentations. Since it opened three years ago, the center has enjoyed ever higher numbers of visitors. And they're the more mature visitors, too, the ones who spend money. Every bit of demographic information from tourism officials says the median age of visitors to Louisiana is getting higher. Older people have money to spend on vacations to expensive cities like New Orleans. Already the French Quarter is turning to cleaner, family-style entertainment. The Aquarium of the Americas, the whole riverfront, and the whole nostalgia thing. It used to be Bourbon Street catered exclusively to the lascivious teen and 20-something crowd. What the Park Service would like to do would be to open some kind of cultural interpretation center for the topic of jazz, talking about the history and the roots of jazz in New Orleans. They think that that may bring in the kind of tourists that we're likely to get over the next decade or so, and at that point, they'll have something mature and intelligent to see. The wheels have begun to turn in Washington to help preserve the less concrete landmarks of lost Louisiana. They are as important as any historic site. The intangible joy that is jazz music has a chance now to live on. Willie Humphrey died in 1994. One more legend we will keep now as a treasured memory. Landmarks and the roots of our culture teach us all more about ourselves. In part two of Lost Louisiana, we'll take a lonesome trip up a lonely highway. We'll travel back in time with a treasured Louisiana photographer, and we'll celebrate a renovation miracle, as well as the sad story of another landmark's demise. 
Join us for the next Lost Louisiana before it's too late.